You're watching our live coverage of uh, the South African National Budget 2022, which has just been delivered by the Minister of Finance, uh, that's uh, Enoch Godongwan. It's his first full budget uh, since he was appointed uh, Finance Minister after the sudden resignation uh, of uh, Tito Mboweni. So what he has done is to deliver a market, I think, that broad, a budget that broadly appears to be supportive of growth, a budget broadly that appears to be supportive of the market, and a budget broadly that also protects the poor. But I'm not the expert. The experts are coming through now to chat to us. Let me introduce them uh, to you. First of all, we have got uh, Professor Patrick Bond. He is a political economist uh, and a scholar of uh, mobilization. Uh, and uh, he joins us now. Prof, thanks very much for coming through. We have uh, Martin Davis, Managing Director at Deloitte and uh, Dean of uh, Deloitte's Academy School of Management. And then we also have uh, Sfiso Skenjan. He is IQ Business Chief, Chief Economist. Gentlemen, Thank you for being with us uh, this afternoon. Let me first begin uh, from a market's perspective. So, Swiss, I'm going to come to you, your initial thoughts. I wanted to compare what you're going to say with what I saw coming through from Johan Els at Old Mutual, and you are saying it's boring. Is it a description that you would attach to this budget? Um, certainly, I don't think boring is, is the description I would use, but I think it was careful. I think uh, he started with... Um, uh, talking about how we ought to proceed with caution. Um, you know, and one of the things, of course, from a developmental point of view, um, in essence, he uh, reaffirmed the commitment for uh, the expenditure towards development projects. Um, and I think also partially responded to the, the call that was heeded by the IMF, particularly responding to reducing expenditure towards SOEs. Um, I think I am still a little bit nervous about the commitment towards ESCOM, both on the contingent liability side as well as the recapitalization of their debt, and also how unclear the picture is with the land bank. Um, I'm, I'm not particularly excited about that. And I think, of course, in, a, in the context of South Africa, trickle-down economics are a myth. And so when you, you, you take the opportunity to reduce corporate income tax, you're not going to get the, the, the economic growth or the tax collection benefit that you want to get in the long run. And so I think they definitely could have used that um, definitely to, to, to look at more household uh, benefits instead of um, looking at corporate income tax uh, from a relief point of view. Interesting. So you don't agree with lowering the corporate income tax rate by a percentage point. You would rather that money was uh, given directly uh, to the poor. Interesting. I, I'll find out what uh, Professor Bond uh, thinks about that. What about the lower budget deficits going forward? We know this has been a big bugbear of the rating agencies and, of course, of the economists. And also, uh, overall, when you look at uh, the uh, debt metrics, they've improved in this budget because of the uh, 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 revenue uh, overruns that we saw. I'm still with you, Sfiso. Sure. No, I think, um, you know, one of the, the, the challenges that we, we're looking at is that the better than expected tax, um, tax collection um, is certainly not uh, what we can expect as a recurring, um, uh, uh, call it a, a revenue a line item. Um, you know, and when you strip that out and you strip out the commodity benefits, we're still paying about 26.4 cents for each rand of revenue towards debt servicing. And so I think there's definitely a big risk around debt servicing. And so to look at the reallocation of, of, of some of this once of uh, income towards lowering debt, I think is a good idea. And particularly because of the global environment where we are going to expect, um, you know, risk off from an emerging market point of view, one, because of course what's happening from a global turmoil point of view, and yeah. that tends to then force money to go into safer havens uh, um, like the US, etc. It, yeah. it tends to then increase our cost of borrowing, and I think the, the move then towards, uh, I think, improved uh, you know, debt numbers from, from a South African point of view, yeah. I think is, is certainly a positive to take out. Sure. Be positive. That, no question about it. Martin, I'm coming to you. Uh, I don't want to... Uh, poke at you and say, speak to this, but I'd like to poke at you still. And uh, I want you to address the issue of uh, measures in this budget that you see as perhaps supportive of growth. Yeah, thanks, Godfrey. Um, look, uh, the, there's this fallacy that we can't have fiscal uh, responsibility and at the same time strong growth. We've had this before. We rewind to 2007, eight. We had a during the gear period um, of responsible fiscal management. We had a growth rate above five percent, 
and the debt to GDP ratio of roughly 27, 28 percent. So there's there's certainly not a, um, a decoupling between between good fiscal management and strong growth. Um, I'm extremely supportive of um, the structural reform rhetoric that the finance minister outlines. The challenge, of course, lies in implementation. Mm. We already have a blueprint for structural reform. It's called the NDP. And all of us, uh, the president talks about social constructs. Well, I, I've not met too many people who disagree of what the NDP, um, uh, what the contents of it are. Therefore, we have already have a social compact. All we need to do is implement. But the challenge, of course, is beyond Treasury, which and Treasury has been the, uh, how can I say, the ballast of the state throughout this uh, decade period of mismanagement that the finance minister himself mentioned mm. and said exactly that. And the finance ministry continues to be prudent, pragmatic and responsible. The challenge really is to how to get other government departments to, to drive structural reform, uh, to liberalize the overall economy, remove the bureauc bureaucracy red tape. Yeah. and start to what Safisa said, I tend to disagree. There will be trickle-down, but you will not get trickle-down in a low to no growth economy, one of such structural sort of bureaucracy and inertia and significant red tape hindering flows of capital, talent and the like, not to mention labor law. Yeah. So um, just some opening comments. Thanks. Absolutely. I still want to stay with you because I want your thoughts in terms of uh, the overall allocation of the resources uh, that has been uh, presented by the minister. Are they supportive sure. of the twin pillars that we have heard the minister speaking about? Number one, re-stimulating growth and secondly, supporting the poor while doing so and being fiscally responsible. Well, you know, uh, the one thing I think fiscal responsibility is coming. It's not a, you can't just sort of, you know, this is not a, a single budget play. It takes time, and and we, we've seen yes, and, and Spisa totally is correct in saying you know the the the, the debt management is a serious problem, of course. Um, fortunately, the debt is 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 mostly domestically held, which yes. prevents us you know which which, which which de risks us to an extent, because if it's dollar denominated in the short term in a in a very volatile currency as our own, you're in a hiding to nothing. But I think the for, for me the real thing is that the uh, the bugbear which has been my bugbear. And I'm sure Patrick will disagree. <laughs> it has been from perhaps the last 20 years of my life has been state owned enterprises. Um, and I've seen this movie every year. Hmm. But it's for me, I think the allocation is 300. I made a note here, got this 308 billion rand to SOEs and sure. 20 billion uh, in a bounce back scheme to small business. Surely that needs to be reversed. Definitely. Those are huge numbers. And if you think if you had taken that money and uh, spend it on other sectors of the economy or perhaps in supporting those who are struggling to make a living or indeed supported business, maybe, maybe the outcome for South Africa as we stand now would have been uh, uh, different. Uh, Prof, let me come to you. Uh, it's the same question that I put to Martin. I want to begin, first of all, with the overall allocation of the resources that you saw and what you think uh, that pains in terms of an overall picture, in terms of commitment and direction that the government wants to go before we talk about uh, the social support side. Well, actually, the critical point is austerity that was announced uh, two years ago by then Finance Minister Mbweni. He, if you recall, as the uh, COVID-19 crisis was just about to hit us, decided to cut the health budget by 3.9 billion rand. That mentality, chop, 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 has gotten worse and worse. And indeed, what happened last uh, October with the medium term uh, budget that goes through 2024 was Finance Minister um, uh, Inok Onigwana actually intensified that inherited austerity, which means double-digit percentage cuts over the next three years in health, in basic education, and in social services, even though uh, President Ramaphosa has made this kind of promise to expand this 350 rand through this coming year, and that we might see if there's enough pressure uh, or enough danger signs like last July's unrest, uh, the need for a basic income grant. You know, we have 50% unemployment, roughly. It's the most unequal country in the world. So I think it's utterly fiscally irresponsible to shoot for a primary budget surplus when the social tensions, the misery, and also the ecological damage is so high. And there's a, a really critical point. We do have a vast foreign debt, 170 billion rand uh, dollars. And in fact, it's not rand, it's dollars. And so Martin, I challenge you, that debt is largely the ESCOM, Madupi, Kusile, 
and some transnet, especially the Chinese rail. Now, to Popo Malefi, the transnet chair's credit, he's tried to renegotiate and he's clawed back a little because that was corrupt, right? There's no question that the Guptas had a finger in those locomotives from China South Rail. So the China Development Bank, which was lending, basically isn't going to be expecting as much. Why aren't we doing the same? for the corrupt loans of ESCOM mm -hmm. on Madupi and Kusile, like the Hitachi and uh, uh, ANC Chancellor House deal that was prosecuted in the United States under the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. I don't think, Martin and Safiso, you disagree with me that excess money going to corruption for coal-fired power plants and coal export locomotives is disastrous. That's the Zuma legacy. You may disagree because I think those should be renegotiated and in, in fact called odious debt. That's the way to bring the debt burden down, not through austerity that hurts poor people. Yeah, I'm getting the sense of disappointment here in terms of the, all your overall thinking and how the minister uh, allocated the resources that he had at his disposal. Oh yes, and especially because of the temporary windfall, because I think all your viewers know, there's been a spike in commodity markets in the bounce back from the terrible 2020 crash uh, of the world economy and China's importing more, but that's volatile. So in August, for example, many of our exports like iron ore crashed 40% in value. Yeah. So this is a very unreliable inflow. And I think it, it's ridiculous to cut the corporate uh, tax rate. You remember it was 52%. <laughs> Safiso and Martin, I don't think you'd uh, appreciate that, but in 1992, we were actually taxing corporates properly. That was during apartheid. And now it's been cut to 27 and we've simply not seen the benefit you know you give the corporates more of incentive yeah. and you expect more in investment and job creation it simply isn't there they're on yeah. capital strike i want us to interrogate how the minister spent the windfall and i think it's an important conversation because uh, well i i'm hoping that you've had a chance to uh go through the numbers and been able to make sense of where he spent that windfall um the broad message that we got was that part of the money is going to obviously be spent on uh, the grants and uh, other social support. Part of the money is going to be used to uh, pay debt, so we reduce the debt burden and also make the debt metrics look a little bit better. I want your analysis and I want your judgment in terms of whether uh, the money has been spent correctly. I don't know if you've got the percentages. Uh, Professor, I'm beginning with you. Yes, I did, I did look at the very, very slight increases from the October cuts in health, education, social development, the really core redistributive uh, you know, functions of the Treasury. So they're not quite as bad, but they're still double digit cuts when you take inflation into account over the next three years. And I think what's so depressing is that we are paying about nine and a half percent interest on our debt in the international markets. Only Brazil, Turkey and Pakistan pay higher uh, uh, amounts, the interest rate uh, amongst the countries that issue 10 year bonds. Yeah. And I think one reason is this country is seen as a complete outflow site for rich people. And if we'd had stronger exchange controls, we could set both domestic and I hope foreign uh, interest rates much lower, more, you know, in tune with the kind of five, six percent that many emerging markets pay. But we're really losing the roughly three to seven percent, according to Treasury, through illicit financial flows. And although we have a current account surplus, which is a benefit at the moment, it's surprising because of the <laughs> trade surplus. Yeah. Um, you know, that's not going to continue. They, they estimate that's going to go into the negative in about three years. So lower interest rates through tighter exchange controls. I think that's ultimately where I would have liked to see much more action than spending all this money on paying down debt, which, you know, basically odious debt. Martin? Yeah, Godfrey, so, so, um, <laughs> so much to talk about. Just on your, on your <laughs> direct question is the, the figure I took, and I haven't gone through the finer detail, of course, of the budget, uh, just beyond the, the minister's speech, but uh, he mentioned that 46% of, of our South African population is currently receiving um, grants. Forty-six yes. percent. We should be ashamed of that. We really should. And we seem to think that somehow the more grants we give, that's some sort of KPI. It should be the opposite. Seventy-six billion rand. I made a note was a figure to job creation. Uh, figures were announced around infrastructure. You know, I, I, I've been saying a lot lately. You know, a lot of this, a lot of the the impact that we require to move a needle from a developmental perspective in our country is not through allocation of capital. It's through the speed of reform and liberalization. 
Sure. What I mean by that is, you know, if you could just free up, which is starting to happen, of course it's happening. We see it in Transnet, as mentioned, we see it in ESCOM, but it's little bits at a time. It's not, it's, it's very gradual reform. It certainly isn't Big Bang. And I'm referring particularly to the energy sector here. Where, cause, because the state seeks to protect vested interests accumulated by SOEs, which continue to implement business models from the Nationalist Party government's economic policy during the height of apartheid. It doesn't make sense to me. The political economy has changed dramatically uh, post-1994 mm-hmm. than what it was pre. And Patrick, you talked to 2 percent corporate tax rate as if somehow that should be normal in, in the early 90s. Well, it was just a direct result of exactly what you're proposing is it's capital exchange controls and at the same time shocking fiscal management by the apartheid government. Hmm. That's someone had to and effectively paying for TVB states, Transcar, Vendor, Bop and Siskai back in the day. Uh, hence the tax burden was so high and unsustainable. Promoting, you know, this would, if the finance minister was talking about that, effectively would make our country uninvestable. So coming back to the point here in terms of how do we move the needle? Mm. So, you know, for me, it, it's reform, uh, labor market reforming, education, create a more skilled work, workforce, liberalize the labor market, give people what South African, what poor people in our country really need is an opportunity. Sure. They haven't even an opportunity. To, to work, to get a job, and of course have the necessary skills to do it. Yeah. The state has been failing in its ability to provide those two key things. Martin, for labor reform, I just wanted to break it down into layman speak. Are we really basically talking here about the ability to hire and fire? No, Godfrey, for me, we have a, and I often repeat this, we have a, a, an economically, politically, morally, unacceptable level of unemployment in our country. And we all agree on that. Uh, yeah. Safisa said, Patrick said, the world's most unequal society where data exists. I must qualify by saying that. Y- yes. And to somehow Very think important. that that having more and more a more bureaucratic labor market, a more more controlled, rigid labor system where the state is determining, you know, uh, you know, has has literally it, it, the tentacles of the state, Leviathan, into every companies in every sector sort of employment policies and strategies i'm afraid at what point what point must, un, must unemployment reach before we think about changing a policy that's clearly not working what is it is it is it 50 percent is it 60 is it 65 youth unemployment's already over that what are you waiting for driver reform this is not a financial issue issue it's a policy issue it is an ideological issue as well Sviso? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I, I definitely hold a very different position on, on, on labor reform to, to Martin, particularly. Are you, are you a socialist? Um, I think <laughs> <laughs> I'm a progressive. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I like that. No, I mean, simply, you know, we, we saw, I think there's a lot, quite a bit of work that came um, around 2007 time when the World Bank actually spent quite a bit of time in the country looking at labor laws and looking at reform. Um, around that and particularly its, its potential impact in terms of doing business and, and, and employment outcomes. And, um, and initially they, they held a particular position them in the IMF that our, our labor laws were restrictive for employment um, outcomes. They made a very quick U-turn around 2015 when they realized that one organized labor in South Africa has been an incredible contributor to um, uh, reducing uh, wage inequality. Um, they uh, looked at um, uh, the role of, of the current labor structure, particularly nuanced to um, the history of industrial relations in Africa, particularly dating back to the 1954 uh, Labor Relations Act, and mm-hmm. the impact it's had in terms of um, creating a marginal society. Yeah. And so simply, it's, I think in, in a theoretical context, looser labor laws may have um, some beneficial uh, gains from an employment um, outcome point of view. But in South Africa, it's empirically been found that it doesn't hold true. And I think that's one of the things. I think um, on, on, you know, and, uh, where I do agree with Martin is also then around other components of reform. You know, um, when we've got 68% of municipalities financially defunct and we still haven't heard a municipal uh, capacity building program, 
um, and municipalities being the network industry that they are um, in both in terms of service delivery, but in terms of economic enablement. Yeah. I think for me, I, I continue to, to remain quite, quite anxious around, around the, the collapse at local government that will actually uh, continue to put fiscal pressure uh, from a revenue point of view. Municipalities yeah. also generate a good component of, of the, I think the largest component of the revenue they tend to get from electricity sales. And yeah. now when you get in some liberalization from an electricity point of view, at some point those are revenues at, at, at risk, and therefore the, the fiscal outlook already from a municipal point of view is at risk, and they're yeah. going to keep coming back to government asking for more support. And so I think around uh, particular questions of reform, I would also really, really, uh, I think, uh, encourage a lot more emphasis around uh, particularly the reform of local government. Yeah, I want you to answer the question around uh, the allocation of the windfall. Do you agree with the, how the minister spent the money? But before you answer that question, I wanted to go back very quickly to Martin. Martin, would you go so far as to say that uh, all these reform efforts that the government is talking about will fail unless labor law is, the, the labor law reforms are carried through? Look, there's, um, got to read, there's, a, there's a wide spectrum of, of structural reforms. And as I mentioned, structural is a media a synonym for difficult, politically difficult to do. Yeah. Uh, and structural reform challenges accumulate to vested interests of the state. That's what it does. And it may be hard for vested, it's hard to break vested interests, but it's necessary to be able to move on and move one's economy forward ultimately. Hmm. So labor law, labor law is merely one structural reform. There's countless others uh, coming up shortly, uh, has been dragging for five, six years. It's a spectrum issue in the telco state. Mm. It's, it's uh, legislation around uncertainty, around policy certainty in the mining sector, for example. Uh, it would be private capital being allowed to participate in, in infrastructure, think, mm. think rail, think ports. We're starting yeah. to see uh, uh, cracks emerge there. Uh, it's education reform. Yes, you know, all of us agree, I'm sure, Patrick's piece all of this money being spent by, by hard taxpayers' money by hardworking, albeit in a minority, South Africans, we don't. Uh, we we we're talking about the quantitative nature of the spend. But ultimately, whether it's and Patrick, whether the, 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 it's up two percent or down two percent, for me, it doesn't really matter. What should matter is the qualitative nature of the spend. Are we as citizens? getting the bang for the buck as to how this money's been allocated. Yeah. In education, I would argue not. In healthcare, no, we're not. In security, no, we're not. So it's the qualitative nature of this and how the state provides public goods and services. That's yeah. a real discussion here. And okay. that's beyond the realm of treasury tragedy. True. Politics comes into play there. And politics is an important part of the discussion we're having. Uh, Sviso, you need to answer uh, me on the issue of uh, whether the minister uh, is appropriately allocating the resources that are coming through from uh, that boom in commodity prices. Sure. I mean, I think um, I've still got to spend quite a lot of time on those numbers. But I think yeah. some of the, 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 the numbers that have come out around particular SOEs for me is uh, definitely a core reallocation of, of, of that um, commodity, uh, I guess, boom in, in that context from a revenue point of view. Um, and, and, and also, I think, uh, you know, the, 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 the narrative that when we're not taxing you, we're doing you a favor, I think not a productive narrative coming out yeah. of the National Treasury. Yeah. The policy position is actually what they often talk about as, as being counter cyclical. And so you've got to spend into a contraction. Once you've got a contraction environment, you've got to spend into growth. And, and, and so I'm, I'm not getting um, a, a real sense around, for example, accelerating the, 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 you know, the project preparation. And we've got more than 368 odd projects uh, from an infrastructure point of view, unbankable. And those are the kinds of expenditure for me appropriations that would, would, would result in more, um, more trickle-down economics and more developmental uh, benefits coming from, from those kinds of projects. And I think um, a lot of money is, is certainly, I think, in, uh, moving in, 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 I think in, in, in funny spaces right now. And I, I certainly will still get into that detail, but, but definitely um, I'm not entirely comfortable, particularly from a, in, an SOE point of view mm -hmm. in terms of the allocation of resources there.
Yeah, Professor Patrick Bond, so no mention of uh, the uh, basic income grant, but lots of talk about support for the vulnerable. I'm reading here from the budget, uh, the government proposing that uh, over the next three years, 3.33 trillion rand uh, to be spent on social wage to support vulnerable and uh, low income households. Um, any of you, was this the right? Uh, is, first of all, do you believe in the numbers? And then secondly, uh, what difference do you think they make? And so, uh, thirdly, uh, do you think uh, the minister could have done better? May, may I jump in? Because I, I think this is still it, double-digit. It is for you. It is for you. It, it's double-digit cuts um, from what we'd been preparing back before COVID-19. And this is a recipe for the so-called IMF riots, right? When people really are squeezed, the kind of, let's say, uh, a catastrophic unrest from last July. Look, the, the, the place you could really raise taxes, because we want this economy to be competitive for exports, and that means raising taxes on the carbon intensity. And this is what Finance Minister Gonagwana reflected on for a few pages, which was there's a climate crisis. It's the biggest threat that uh, our society and everyone uh, faces. Currently, we have a, a carbon tax of about six rand when you take into account all the exemptions. So what he said, he's pushing up to $30 per ton, which would be 450 rand by 2030. Now, that's still not enough. It's nowhere near, like right now, Sweden has $132 uh, carbon tax. So we need to go higher. And that way, as Gordon Guana himself admitted, we could then deal with the carbon, uh, what's called carbon border adjustment mechanism, that is climate sanctions that are coming down on us very hard starting next year. Mm. I think that's the, the biggest single long-term area to raise taxes on high carbon corporates and change the energy system and prevent South Africa from having those climate taxes. So I hope at least that one little piece of it gets more and more attention. We see how we can ratchet it up so it's not just you know, the 450 rand, but it gets to a real uh, level. In fact, the, the, the social cost of carbon is now estimated at 45,000 uh, rand per ton. That is uh, uh, basically 100 times higher than what Gordon Guan is projecting for 2030. Those are some of the big areas in addition to protecting the poor, it's protecting the environment from climate catastrophe. Sure. Um, Martin, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Feel free, Sviso, feel free to, if you want to add anything to that conversation. But I wanted to bring in another line here, the SOEs. The minister detailing 308 billion rand spent on those uh, uh, failing companies or some of them which are failing uh, money which could have been spent uh, better perhaps in other areas. I don't know if I missed it or perhaps it's in the line items, but did you hear anything, anything in terms of fresh allocation of resources to state-owned enterprises in this budget? Martin, I'll start with you. Swiss, I'll come to you. Yeah, this is a, using your word, um, Godfrey, ideological issue which clearly um, we, um, we, we are a part here. One of the, the key risks that the finance minister himself, himself spoke about was SOEs. In the next sentence, he spoke about, he used the words rationalization and consolidation mm. of state enterprises. He, he won't use the word privatization because yes. it's ideologically <laughs> offensive to, to many in, uh, in, in the political realm for some reason. Um, but he, and he went on to say that South Africa would become, and we've heard about this before, is a real shining light in terms of constructing very innovative triple Ps. Yeah. Um, and that's pretty much, in ANC speak, the same thing, it seems. So, so the SOEs, again, what, what people forget about SOEs is not just sucking up our hard-earned rands, um, but at the same time, it squeezes out competition. Mm -hmm. And ultimately... Um, when, when states, when a state seeks to constrain competition, it impedes productivity, it impedes efficiency and, and, and ultimate national competitiveness. Is efficiency only results and productivity only increases through competition. So I would like to see ultimately, and this is my ideological ideal perhaps, yeah. is a state that, that, that actively encourages um, intense competition yeah. Um, Schumpeter styles, creative destruction is needed to unleash new areas of growth, new value creation, ultimately new jobs and, and, and new areas of innovation. And that's something which, which, which is <coughs> typically, no matter what yeah. country you're in, yeah. have not been known for.
Absolutely. But I think perhaps that process has started because we heard the president speak about uh, uh, the private sector working with, uh, I think, uh, the railways people and also the port system. So hopefully that's the beginning and we'll begin to see uh, competition coming into that sector. As FISO, any fresh Great money into... Yeah. Any fresh money that you saw coming into the SOEs or are we done with them? Um, I think, you know, when we heard the minister talking about these turnaround plans that they're expecting from the SOEs, I think they're definitely um, prepping us and continuing us as well. There's probably some relief that's going to come um, in, in, in the medium term. Yeah. Um, depending <clears throat> on, on which of the SOEs that you're looking at. Um, I think so that's one of the things. And I think just... Um, you know, I've been reflecting on the on the point that, that Martin made earlier on around kind of the, a qualitative view on on, uh, on budget appropriation. And one of the things, and, and that's why I'm quite interested to read um, the amendments in the uh, budget appropriation bill that have been tabled. One of the things that has come out quite clearly is that the, there's an impact lens that has been missing in the way in which budget appropriation has been approached. It's yeah. mostly been metrics based, and so they look at kind of population dynamics and say, between here and there, if there's this many people, we need to build a school or a hospital. But you can't, if you go to National Treasury right now and you ask them, if you've got one rand and you must spend that between education, between a hospital and a school, which one will you spend it on? Yeah. And they won't be able to give you an impact-based view on that because we're missing the impact lens in terms of how we think and approach our, bu our budget appropriation. And I think it's one of the things also that's ought to come in when we think about the, the SOEs themselves and, yeah. and our thinking and our philosophy towards shoring them up. We're hearing uh, Minister Gautamwana talking about that there's a stressed element in the ESCOM debt, but he's not giving us the number. Yeah, and so true. pretty much that is a component of the debt that must be recapitalized or pretty much yeah. written off in terms of the, those, those agreements. Um, as well as then, uh, as I said, with the other SOEs, I mean, if you look at AXA, for example, it yeah. had been profitable for 19 out of 20 years That's prior true. to COVID, um, you know. And so if you appropriate, for example, really a kind of relief for that kind of uh, uh, sure. SOE, you might get the kind of benefit that you that you, you may need. And so I think yeah. the impact component in the appropriation towards SOE is definitely missing. And I think that would also bring okay. the, the thinking and the ideologies um, from the government point of view on why they choose to continue. For sure. So, so, so you're touching very quickly on politics, and I wanted us to go with uh, uh, your assessment very quickly, very quickly, all of you, if I can get you, if I can squeeze you inside a minute. Um, what we didn't speak about overall, uh, whether this budget is uh, a budget that speaks to the challenges that the ANC has faced uh, in the past few years, including, of course, uh, last year's municipal elections. Do you detect any elements here that uh, this could be laying the ground uh, for the ANC to try to raise its support? Very quickly, Sfiso, I'll come to Martin, I'll come to the prof. No, I think uh, it's certainly um, still not for me a particularly pro poor budget. Um, okay. It's still not leaning to any political rhetoric, and okay. so it's definitely not going to do anything for political points. Okay, Martin? Yeah, look, the, 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 the Treasury has always been um, incredibly, as I used that phrase earlier, the ballast in times of, of, of very poor governance. Yeah. Um, and, and thank goodness for that, of course, last 10 years or so. But of course, considering the dire need and the uh, among lower strata of society, and at the same time, the, um, the basic income grant for social, social safety extension it's necessary from an ethical perspective because yeah. of failed economic policy and yes. labor policy, but at the same time, it's good for politics. So it's two sides of the same coin. Okay. Uh, Prof? Yeah, I see two competing ideologies and groups of power. Uh, the first group uh, is the mass ANC support base, and they're departing. They're not going to vote. And for 2024, Continuing with austerity will continue that. The second block, let me call them the three brothers that state captured treasury back in 1994. I don't mean the Sheikhs, I don't mean the Watsons, and I don't mean the Guptas. I mean the three brothers in Manhattan, Standard & Poor's, Fitch & Moody's, the credit rating agencies. Those three brothers seem to still have state captured treasury, and that's a recipe for long-term decline of the ruling party's popularity and for our own democracy.
diversity of opinion, absolutely uh, the strength of uh, this uh, country's uh, democracy. No question about that. Professor Patrick Bond, thank you very much indeed. Martin Davis from Deloitte, thank you. As uh, Fisos Kenjan from IQ Business, 